apologies, I can't see anything. So thanks for the introduction, Wade. As mentioned, my name is Georgia Atkins-Smith and I'm super stoked to be here tonight chatting with you all about science. So luckily for you all, tonight I haven't come empty-handed, but I've actually got some freebies tonight from a very incredible scientist and now artist. So Ivan Poon, who's been my long-term mentor, so a little bit of incentive for you guys to get interactive tonight. If you get some questions right, you get some freebies. So, like many of you here tonight, I am also uh, a researcher or an academic. And now, as a postdoc, I've learned that that meant I spent probably four years of my life putting together a nearly 300-page thesis that only two people in the whole world will ever read. <laughs> so, to my students over there, a little bit of an incentive to keep on pushing. So tonight I really want to start off by asking you all this really important question. What is the cure to cancer? <laughs> well, obviously I don't have the answer to this question. If I did, I most definitely wouldn't be living in a townhouse in Glenroy. But hopefully tonight I can really break down the complexity of this question, peel back the layers that go into cancer research, and share with you an insight into why curing cancer is just so difficult. But first of all, when I look at this sentence, a few words really stick out to me as problematic. In addition to history, politics, geography, and as I've now learned, pub quiz general knowledge or trivia, English is definitely not my forte. So like the good academic I am, Tonight, I've brought in a very important and qualified reference to help me break down this question on the screen. Sordello et al, 2021, also known as my dear friend Miranda Sordello sitting in the audience tonight, is a year 11 and 12 English teacher from the Suzanne Corey High School. So Miranda, to put you on the spot for just one minute, if I can get some of your expertise, what actually is the definition of the word the? If you can... <laughs> If you can shout, or... Right. That makes a lot of sense, I guess. Um... <laughs> The second question I have for you is, in your professional exp expertise, is the word cure a singular or a plural term? Okay. Okay, so thank you, reference. <laughs> Clearly not set up at all. Putting this together, what I have learned is the word the can be used to denote both singular and plural terms, but the, the word cure is actually a singular noun. And this is the problem, the cure to cancer. The phrase that we need to find and that we are searching for, the cure to cancer, arguably represents the biggest misconception in all of science and cancer research. Cancer is such an umbrella disease, an umbrella term, used to encompass such a wide mass of diverse conditions. And therefore, as we break down these layers that go into cancer research, the first layer is that of the disease, the cancer. Cancers come in all shapes and forms. And in particular, we can generally separate them based onto two categories, one being solid cancers. Solid cancers include those like prostate cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, glioblastomas, and so many more. These are cancers that grow in a mass, a mass of tumorous or cancerous cells that can form a tumor. Although these cells uh, can move to a different location of the body, for example, how a breast cancer may metastasize from the breast to the bone or to the lung, at these new regions, these cancers will typically continue to, to take their form in that solid cancer and clump-like appearance. Now, in comparison to solid cancers, blood cancers are very, very different. Blood cancers are rapidly moving and flowing throughout the entire vasculature of the patient's body in all of their blood vessels from head to toe. 
Blood cancers include those like leukemias, like acute myeloleukemia, T-cell leukemias. They also include lymphomas, myelomas, and others. Therefore, different cancers have different properties. And we need to take this into consideration when generating therapeutics. We need to ask, what kind of cancer is it? Where does it grow? How does it form? And what kind of molecular properties does it have that we could potentially exploit? If we take a further dive into breast cancer, we know that when patients are diagnosed with breast cancer, it's not just one kind of breast cancer. But there are generally three different subgroups of breast cancer. There is the subgroup one, the hormone receptor positive, subgroup two, HER2 positive, and subgroup three, triple negative. And now I'm not going to go into the science about what these categories mean, but simply to highlight that the kind of subgroup that a, of cancer that a patient has directly dictates their therapeutic options. For example, if a patient was diagnosed with subgroup 1, they might be treated with hormone-blocking agents like tamoxifen. And these treatments would essentially be ineffective if given to patients who had subgroup 3. So different cancers need to be treated in different ways. But just like cancers that are all extremely diverse, so are we. So therefore, we, the people, the patients, resemble the second layer of complexity. In 2003, one of the most ambitious and informative scientific projects in human history was completed. A project that would continue to influence the future of medical research for years to come. Does anyone know what this project was? And I do have prizes. There's too many. Human Genome Project, yes. I cannot see you, but I have a prize for you. There's also another prize for somebody who knows how much the Human Genome Project cost. Anyone? Anything? A lot. A lot. Seven, $2.7 billion. The Human Genome Project, ta the Human Genome Project taught us that we humans are a result of about 30,000 genes present in 23 pairs of chromosomes made from deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. It taught us that our DNA consists of over 3 billion individual components called nucleotides, or base pairs. And these come in the form of A, T, G, and C. Adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And together, all of this DNA can fit into one tiny individual cell that makes up your body. So to get you to really appreciate this and appreciate how incredible your bodies and science are, let's take some inspiration from the modern day pop artist or rapper Big Shaq and do some quick math. <laughs> so as we know, DNA is made of nucleotides. So nucleotides are about 0.34 nanometers in length. And as I told you, we have about 3 billion. But we also have two copies of each gene. Therefore, if you multiply 0.34 nanometers by 3 billion by 2, we get about 2 billion and 40 million nanometers of DNA in one cell, which is about 2 meters. However, the human body is, comp is comprised of over 23 trillion cells. So multiply 23 trillion by 2 meters of DNA, and we get the grand total of over 46 trillion meters of DNA within your body. This 46 trillion meters of DNA is your genetic recipe and makes you, you. But it also makes you 99.9% .9 genetically similar to that person sitting next to you. However, this 0.1% difference is still enough to have a really big impact. Through the Human Genome Project, scientists uncovered that there are about 1 million locations within our DNA that differs between people. These are called singular nucleotide polymorphisms. On top of this, there are also genetic mutations that can occur throughout life and throughout development. If we were to then peel back yet another layer of complexity, we could also dive or delve into the impact of our environment. Many of you would recognize this very famous scientist and very famous scientific equation, but 
Move over Einstein, we don't care about that equation. Have any of you heard of this scientific equation? P equals G plus E. Phenotype equals genotype plus environment. Our phenotype, what we actually look like, is a combination of our genotype, so our genetics, and the world around us, our diet, our lifestyle, how much we exercise, where we live, how much beer we drink, factors in our environment that impact us. Together, the combination of our genotype and our environment makes you, you. It gives us your, our personality, our individuality, and it makes us unique. However, this also impacts how we may experience different diseases. Whether you suffer from a mild or a robust, um, a mild or a severe influenza infection, whether you have a robust immune response, and how you may respond to different disease therapeutics. For example, because of your genetics, you may process a drug faster or better, slower or not at all compared to somebody else. Because of this, personalised medicine is the way of the future. Personalised medicine takes into consideration the genetics of each individual person and uses this information to inform therapeutic decisions. One of the best examples of this can be taken from the case of Jason. Jason was, or is, a 10-year-old boy who was diagnosed with a kind of leukaemia called acute lymphoblastic leukaemia. Jason also happens to be one of the 10% of all Caucasians that have a genetic mutation that impairs their ability to process a kind of chemotherapeutic agent called thiopurines. This meant that if Jason was given the standard dosage of chemotherapy, that he would likely have really severe side effects and the cancer would probably return. However, luckily enough, when Jason was first admitted and diagnosed with leukemia, one of the first things that the physicians or the doctors did was take a sample of his blood. They could then screen his blood and screen his DNA and were able to detect this mutation. Because of this information, they could then adjust the dosage of chemotherapy accordingly and treat Jason properly. And because of this, Jason is in remission. Personalised medicine using our own, your individual genetic information to inform therapeutic decisions. But despite all of this complexity between people and between cancers, one thing that nearly groups every single anti-cancer drug together is its end goal. The goal to kill and eliminate the cancer cell. If I was to stop and summarise so far, I've currently told you that all cancers are extremely diverse. I've told you that we, the people, the patients, are extremely diverse. And so I think you can assume what I'm going to tell you about the way that our cells can die. It's also extremely diverse. And therefore, cell death resembles the final layer of complexity. And this is where my research comes in. And there's nothing that I love more than killing cells in the lab and seeing how they die. Cell death arguably or understanding the molecular details of cell death arguably represents the most important scientific question. Too much cell death and organs can completely decay, like that observed during neurodegenerative diseases. Too little cell death, and this is when cells can rapidly grow and proliferate, like we see during cancer. If we were to go back all the way to 1972, this is when the Aussie pathologist by the name of John Kerr first characterised cell death by apoptosis, now the most commonly studied and well understood type of cell death. And it's also Greek for leaves falling from a tree. However, fast forward to here, the year of 2021, and we now know that there are in fact over 12 different ways that one single cell can die. And all of these kinds of cell death have a very different impact. Like apoptosis, sometimes cells can die in what we call an immunologically silent way. It can occur and not really kick up a fuss to the surrounding environment. The cells nearby in the tissue don't really care that it's happening. For example, in the time that it's taken me to say this one sentence, 10 million cells within my body would have died via apoptosis. 
but I'm still alive and kicking. My tissue's not red. It's not swelling. And this is because these cells are dying via this immunologically silent way. However, sometimes our body wants to ring the alarm bells. Therefore, sometimes cells can die in what we call a pro-inflammatory way. They bring in the reinforcements. They recruit key immune cells to the site of cell death through the release of molecules called cytokines. And there are quite a lot of pro-inflammatory forms of cell death. It includes that like necrosis, where the cell can essentially just pop in a really unregulated way, like a pin bursting a balloon. There's also necroptosis, like you can see in this video from my lab member Andre at the Weehai. During necroptosis, cells also burst, but what you can't see in this video is that key proteins are being trafficked to the surface of the cell and essentially punching holes in the membrane of the cell in a very organised and controlled fashion. There's pyroptosis, and like the name suggests, of pyro is associated with the heat of the, or the fire of the inflammation that it causes. And it's also driven by a molecular complex called the inflammasome. And probably my favourite form of cell death is nettosis. Nettosis occurs in a really special immune cell called a neutrophil. And it essentially resembles the spider web of death. When these cells die, they can shoot out a web made from their own DNA to trap and entangle pathogens like bacteria. So cells die in very different ways, and the impact of cell death has a very different consequence. So we need to ask, what is the best way that we can kill cells with anti-cancer therapeutics? For example, if you think about a leukaemia, which we all now know is a blood cancer spread throughout the whole body from head to toe in the blood vessels. He's obviously not enjoying the talk very much. <laughs> I'm nearly done. So we know leukaemia is throughout the entire human body. So we probably don't want to kill leukaemia cells via a pro-inflammatory manner. As this we did, this could induce widespread or systemic inflammation. Therefore, my work, the WeHi, is renowned for the development of an anti-cancer drug called venetoclax. Venetoclax can induce apoptosis, the immunologically silent form of cell death. Venetoclax is now being used all around the world in the clinics to treat and cure patients of leukemia. But in comparison to blood cancers like leukemia, Maybe sometimes we want to induce inflammation. If we think about a tumour, which is localised generally to one specific location, if we could kill that cancer via pyroptosis or necroptosis and induce inflammation, we could also induce the recruitment of really important immune cells to that specific location to aid the death of the cancer and aid the removal of the cancer. So when we put all of this together, all of these different layers of complexities that go into cancer research, when we think about developing cures for cancer, we need to have a very complicated, but probably a three-step approach. We need to think about the cancer. <laughs> what kind of cancer is it? Where does it grow? How does it form? And what kind of molecular properties does it have? We need to think about the patient, the people. What is, who is the patient? What are their genetics? And how would they potentially respond to different anti-cancer therapeutics? And we need to think about the route to cell death. What is the best way that we can kill those cells to ensure the best elimination of the cancer and the best recovery of the patient? So with all of this complexity in mind, to all of those conspiracy theorists in the world who are saying that the government is withholding the cure to cancer, I guess the government must have a shit ton of storage space. So, thank you very much for your time. Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.